Hello, uh, I'm Sasha Epskamp, and I am going to give a guest lecture for this week in BL4246. Um, so uh, who, am, who am I? Uh, I am uh, originally from Amsterdam, where I did my PhD, and I worked as assistant professor. And uh, last year I moved uh, to Singapore, to the National University of Singapore, right here. I'm now working as associate professor uh, here in Singapore. I teach here on data science in psychology. So I teach one of the other capstone modules, BL4245, for example. I teach on structural equation modeling and I'm going to teach recent statistics, um, actually recent statistics uh, too, next year. Uh, my research is about network psychometrics, uh, about longitudinal data analysis, and about psychological methods in general. And I'm also a research director at the NUS psychology department. I'm associate editor for two methodological journals, and I did a lot of work in R. I made a lot of R packages, uh, some of the packages you've been using in this course. And I also have a YouTube channel where I make some videos, um, and I plan to make more videos. If you want to learn more about structural equation modeling, for example, then uh, you can go to my YouTube channel and you, you can learn more. At the NUS, I now started the lab on psychological methods which uh, is above, it's, it's empty now, but uh, I have a lot of plans to lab. Um, mainly I'm going to uh, work on network psychometrics, um, uh, developing tools for doing network analysis uh, in the lab, but mostly focusing on longitudinal analysis. Uh, for example, how do we analyze data with multiple waves of data, or if you have intensive time series, uh, things like that. Um, I also will focus on improving psychological science, Questions like how do we improve our producibility of results? How do we um, uh, investigate what threats there are to replicability? Uh, things like that. And uh, potentially also uh, AI research. And my idea with the labs also that I wanted to make uh, to make it an active um, an active community around uh, methodological research expertise uh, at NUS. So hopefully uh, that will get it off the ground uh, in the coming years and. If you're interested in this, in my work in the NUS Methods Lab, or want to be involved, uh, please send me a message on Canvas or send me an email um, or knock on my door. And I'm happy to add you to a mailing list, for example, about plans I'm going to do. I also developed a lot of R packages. So these are R packages that I, I currently maintain on CRON. Um, I think some of you of them you will know. So for example, the QGraph package is a package I made for network visualization. Bootnet is a package I made for um, bootstrapping results and for having a more general platform for estimating networks. And Melfar, GraphicalVar are packages that I made for uh, estimating networks from longitudinal data. Um, Ising Sampler and Ising Fit are for estimating Ising models. Uh, Ising Fit I actually did not make, but I maintain it now. And uh, the Psychonetrix package is actually the biggest project I'm working on at the moment. This is a big R package for confirmatory network modeling and psychometric network modeling. Um, for example, you can do multi-group analysis in there, or you can um, yeah, involve, include latent variables. Uh, and there's some methods for longitudinal data analysis that are not available in other packages um, and things like that. I'll talk more about that at the end of this lecture as well. Um, but if you're interested in that also, uh, please uh, reach out. Now, before I go into the topic of this lecture, which is about longitudinal network analysis, I first wanted to take a quick detour and talk a bit about my background before I started doing all this and making all these, these R packages. So I come from uh, Amsterdam, which is a city in, in Europe, in the Netherlands. It looks a bit like this, lots of bikes, lots of canals. Uh, usually it's not as sunny there, it's usually raining, cold, dark, but um, yeah, we have flowers. It's, it's a nice city to live in. Here I did my uh, PhD and I also uh, was an assistant professor. Uh, so I uh, actually found an old picture of me at the start of my uh, PhD uh, with people from uh, the department. So this is this is me. I had hair back then. Um, this is our uh, uh, head of department, Han van der Maas. Uh, Danny Borsboom was my PhD supervisor and uh, Anceli Kramer here. It's also someone I worked with a lot. And I think here we are um, doing rope pulling against the undergraduate students. Uh, and I am pretty sure we won this contest. 
Uh, anyway, uh, Hans van der Maas, Danny Borsboom, and Nancy Kramer, who I highlight here. Before I started doing a PhD, they wrote this paper on uh, a network perspective to comorbidity. And this paper was published in 2010. So it was written in 2008, 2009, somewhere around that, that time. And I think this is the first paper that was really on the network perspective to clinical psychology on network perspective to psychopathology. And this has been a very, very influential paper because lots of uh, following papers that you also learned about in this course uh, followed up on, on this work. Um, so what uh, Angelique, uh, Han, Danny, and, uh, and Lawrence Waldorf here did is uh, it's more of a conceptual paper because we actually did not have any methods back then. So there was no QGraph or BootNet or any of these methods available. It's more of a conceptual method about the idea that symptoms can influence each other. And then uh, here there's also a, a data analysis, but this was more of a, a preliminary data analysis. Um, that uh, used, uh, I think, uh, logist uh, log odds to draw edges here between uh, binary items. And it was drawn using a software called uh, Cytoscape, so not an R yet, because there was no good R tool for that available at the time. And this was the first version of the ideas that would later become the, the networks that you've been studying so far in this course. Now, I was an undergraduate student at this time, and think in my second year of my studies, so that more junior than you are now. And Danny Borsbaum here gave a, uh, a lecture on, on, on this, and he said, uh, if you're interested in this, uh, please reach out. I need help. I need uh, an RA. Uh, please help uh, reach out if you're interested in this and want to work a bit more on this. So I thought it was uh, nice. So I reached out to Danny Borsbaum and uh, I uh, sent him a mail saying, well, I'm an undergraduate student. I uh, looking for some things to do in my studies. Uh, is there any way I can help? So I met up with uh, Danny Borsbaum and Anstey Kramer, and they had a project that they needed help with, uh, and it involved data that looked a bit like uh, this. Actually, not a bit. This is exactly the data that, that they had and that they, they sent me back then. They were trying to make a network of the DSM, the Diagnostic Mental uh, Manual for Mental Disorders, and uh, what they had, they already classified all the symptoms in the DSM. So on this left document here, you see all the symptoms of the DSM uh, under each other. And then they also encoded for each symptom by each disorder, if a symptom was part of a disorder. So they had a big binary matrix with a row for each symptom, a column for each disorder in the DSM, and simply a one indicating that symptom is in the disorder, and a zero indicating a symptom is not in the disorder. Now, what they wanted to do is make a symptom by symptom network where a, two symptoms are connected with each other if they share a disorder. So we have this matrix here that you see on the right. Lots of rows for each symptom, a column for each disorder, a one indicating of symptoms part of the disorder. And they needed a binary matrix where there's a row and a column for each symptom and a one indicating if they share the same disorder. That's what they needed help with. So uh, they asked me, uh, well, Sasha, do you know R? Because that would probably be useful. And then I said, no, no, I, I don't know R. I have never used it before in my life. I don't know what you're talking about. And then they suggested that I would uh, learn it to do this. And I tried, but yeah, I couldn't. It was, it was really hard for me to learn R. Uh -huh. I didn't have a course to guide me. I was trying stuff myself. I couldn't really figure it out. Um, so I, I, I gave up after trying for a bit, but I still wanted to solve this, this project and uh, do this work because I found it interesting. So I started to do this uh, manually in Excel. So <clears throat> I actually uh, took the row that belonged to one symptom, took the row that belonged to another symptom, put them both in a new uh, sheet, multiplied with each other. Uh, then you get a one if they have uh, are in the same disorder. Uh, sum that, then you get something above zero if they share at least one disorder together. And then you put that element in a large, uh, like 500 by 500 adjacent matrix, and you do this a lot of times for every possible combination of symptoms. 
that took a very long time i spent i think two three weeks uh several hours per day doing this in excel uh, manually to get the first version of this uh, matrix and i succeeded i got a matrix and we could actually visualize it it was a nice first picture to see um, but later i uh, learned uh, i asked uh, someone okay uh, that has a bit of r expertise uh, yeah okay how so how can i do this in r and I learned that if you do know R, you can do this in uh, a few minutes by using a for loop. And if you know R even better, you can do this in a second by simply multiplying a matrix by its transpose, which uh, gives you the same result. And uh, when I learned that, I realized that learning R is, is pretty valuable, and I started to... Uh, to, to learn it. Uh, I wanted to, um, to, to tell you the story because uh, I know that especially the first time you experience working with R, it can be uh, pretty daunting. And uh, yeah, that's the same for everybody. It's uh, even people that are now doing a lot of R, when they started, it was never uh, that easy, right? So don't let that, uh, that scare you. And uh, I also uh, wanted to share that you don't need a lot of experience with R, with programming to begin with, to be able to do this type of research or contribute, right? You can, you can learn that at some point. And if you do it more and more, you, uh, you learn more and more. So this, uh, work, uh, eventually we did it in R and that was uh, a bit easier to do. And, uh, that led to this paper called the small world of psychopathology. Well, and this is the network actually that we got out of it where uh, every node here is a, uh, is a symptom and every edge here indicates that two symptoms are in the same uh, disorder. And the nice thing about this network is that most symptoms were in this giant component here, this, this large component of uh, symptoms are connected with each other, which formed a small world structure that are a few symptoms that were really like uh, very um, strongly connected to lots of nodes, like acting as the bridges between uh, the clusters, but there's also this uh, natural clustering, which is actually the clustering of the, the disorders. Um, this network was visualized by iGraph, which we used before, and you might have seen in the course come by sometimes, um, but iGraph didn't work that well. Uh, it was pretty hard to make a picture like this, to do it in a, in a nice way. And especially if you wanted to make weighted networks like the one that Angelique and, and Danny made, it's not that easy. You needed to do a lot of codes, a lot of coding. Um, so I had the idea of, of automating that and um, writing some R code that automates most of the work that uh, you need to do to visualize a network using iGraph. And while I was working on that, at some point I thought, okay, I don't actually need iGraph. I can actually do it myself. And that's how I developed this, uh, this QGraph package for R, which uh, plots uh, a network uh, in R. And actually, the way it plots the network is pretty simple. Like this is just a scatter plot. So these nodes here, they're just points in the scatter plot. And these lines here are just lines between the points in the scatter plot. Because if we don't have the axis and we choose the placement in a way and we choose coloring in a way, it, it, it has a network look. But that's actually uh, what's behind here. Um, so yeah, so I had this idea of making a nice uh, contribution, a nice paper uh, package that uh, people could use. And um, I wrote a paper about that. And that's all when I was uh, still a student, so before starting my uh, my PhD studies. Um, which I also wanted to share because it shows that, yeah, if you have a nice idea, uh, the nice thing about open source software is that you can actually, you can make a contribution. You can, okay, you can think of something that you think is needed or is missing in R or something you think is useful for other people, you can actually just, just write the code and, and contribute it and people can use it. And that's, uh, yeah, quite a nice thing about open source uh, software. Now, after that, I uh, started to do my uh, PhD and uh, I wrote this on the topic of network psychometrics where I was one of the people working a lot on um, yeah, fleshing out the methodology of estimating a network from data. So figuring out a real methodology and methodological reasons behind that. 
Um, so I worked a lot on uh, estimating these type of models from data. Uh, for example, I implemented some models uh, methods for estimating networks in the QGraph package, uh, like this GTMod select uh, algorithm that we use here, or the, the EBC G lasso algorithm. Uh, that can be used in cross-sectional data. Uh, but I also worked a lot on um, working out methods for estimating networks from longitudinal data or time series data. And uh, that's, of course, what this, this lecture is about. Now, um, well, the picture is one thing. The hard part, of course, was the mathematics behind it. So I won't bother you with this detail, but uh, the cross-section networks actually aren't even that hard mathematically. Uh, the longitudinal networks are quite a lot harder to figure out. So that, that took a long time. And still, there are lots of... Um, there are lots of things that are not trivial about longitudinal networks because you have some more assumptions that you need to deal with. Uh, it's, it's, it's generally a bit harder. Now, you don't have to know this, this math, but if you are really interested in what's behind these methods, then uh, this is the starting point uh, to, to try to understand them. But uh, in the lecture, I'll just uh, focus on the conceptual details. Okay, that's it for the introduction. And in the next video, I'll uh, talk about uh, estimating um, longitudinal networks.